the Committee on Environment, Land, Agriculture and Procurement Reform calls this public hearing to order. It is now seven minutes after five on Wednesday, October 10th, 2018. Present with me at this hearing today is to my right, Vice Speaker, Acting Speaker, Therese Sterlahi. Uh, to her right is Senator Regine Bisco Lee. To her right is Senator Tilina Nelson. And to the far right is Senator Mary Torres. To my left is Senator Will Castro. To his left is Senator Joe San Augustine. To his left is Senator Luis Munoz. So thank you very much for joining us this evening. The purpose of this public hearing is to receive testimony on Bill 342-34 COR introduced by myself. It is an act to authorize the Chamorro Land Trust Commission to enter into a 50-year lease with the Guam Racing Federation to continue the Guam Raceway Park. Notice of this afternoon's public hearing was provided to senators, stakeholders, and the local media on October 1st, 2018, and on October 5th, 2018, thus meeting the requirements of the open government law. The committee will continue to receive written testimony until 4 p.m. on Friday, October 12th. Please address testimonies to Senator Thomas C. Ada, Chairperson, Committee on Environment, Land, Agriculture, and Procurement Reform, and it can be dropped off to the mailboxes here at the legislature or emailed to office at senatorada.org. Now, uh, before we begin the testimony, we do have uh, a number of people that have signed up already. But I'm going to go ahead and exercise the prerogative of the chair and call um, a couple of people out of sequence. Um, and so I would first like to defer uh, Senator Casper Bauer. Uh, you signed up uh, to provide testimony. Uh, I would like to defer to the senator uh, to provide testimony first. He'll be then followed by officials from the Department of Land Management, um, Mr. Mike Borja, and of course you can have uh, Joey join you up here at the table. Um, so after these three gentlemen have uh, completed their testimony, I will then call out names um, on the, uh, according to the sign-up uh, sheet, okay? So, Mike, if you please go ahead and, and join them at the table. Joey, are you going to join them? Okay. Senator, please proceed. Senator, I want to recognize the presence of uh, former Vice Speaker Ted Nelson, but I didn't, did you, did you sign up to testify? Okay. You're supporting. Thank you very much, Vice Speaker. Uh, Vice Speaker, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask that uh, maybe you step forward and, for the record, state that into the mic, please. And not that I don't trust you, but it's nice to have it on the, on the, on the record for, for history. And also present with us is former Senator uh, Mike Limtiako. Thank you very much, Senator. I'm not going to defer to you because you don't have the age yet. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Senator Casper Bauer. Um, Mr. Chairman. Hey, wait, uh, sorry. Of the okay, go ahead. And to all my. Now, now, he would got to the uh, microphone. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Committee, and all to my relative on the, on the left and the right. And of course, one thing we should never forget, and perhaps I'm going to do something. Different, Mr. Chairman, can we just stand up and think of my brother-in-law, my nephew, Juan Sobato, short prayer?
that, give me such a chance. I'll be very brief. <clears throat> For many years, I have supported Zubado, Henry, Oscar, and all the pioneers that started over near property also in that prize. And I'm here again, 20 some years later, still taking the same position. These gentlemen have done a lot tremendously to help the people go, especially the drivers, especially the young kids, especially those that are coming up when we're interested in automobile racing. I ask you folks, I want to stand here, say before you, Mr. Chairman, and member of the committee, to please Basta, make a motion and pass this bill. But really, Mr. Chairman, I thank you. I thank Mr. Tobato. I thank Henry. I thank Oscar Cow. And all the, of course, my primo here, Kaspar Bar, my primo, Borja, and all the others, for their involvement in this another historic movement that you are ready to embark. So with that, my dear people of Guam, please help, help us share your testimony to Speaker Ada and other members of the committee. Submit your testimony. Call in every senator, because we won. By the time, Mr. Chairman, you finish, I want to see 15 yes vote for this bill. Thank you, sir. Thank you, people. Sidhu Smase, Vice Speaker. I'm running out of rap voice. Sidhu Smase. Senator Kaspovar. Sidhu Smase, and good evenings. Vice Speaker, Acting Speaker, Senators. As I look, uh, I believe you're the only former colleague of mine sitting up there. <laughs> and I guess you'll join our ranks uh, in, a, in a couple of months. Uh, I almost felt like we could uh, close after that uh, enthusiastic uh, presentation by Vice Speaker Nelson. I, uh, I certainly agree with him. And I, um, I don't have written comments. I have a few notes here. And uh, please bear with me. Um, I know Vice Speaker Nelson lives, or did live, I'm not sure now, near where the current racetrack is located. And I was uh, a little bit surprised and kind of happy to hear his comments, how he supported this all along. Because there were others some 20 years ago who lived nearby, even maybe in Jigo, who said, gee, it's going to be too noisy and all those kinds of things. But um, uh, they found out that it uh, works out quite well. Uh, we live quite a ways from Anderson Air Force Base and we hear a lot of planes coming and going and um, someone, uh, many have agreed that it's for the common good that we have an uh, Air Force Base. Um, somebody's agreed that it's for the common good that we have a military buildup on Guam and that uh, 5,000 or more will be located right near my house. Some uh, 40 years ago, there was only one car every half hour on Route 3. Now there's hundreds of cars in a half hour on Route 3. And so I had to sit back and say, um, I guess it's been for the common good that we have a military base and we have planes, and it's for the common good of our people that we have a military buildup. And, uh, Apparently that it's in my backyard uh, it must be also for the common good. And I say this because I'm torn a little bit between land trust and supporting the land trust program and this um, build up, if you will, of this raceway park. Uh, I know when we talk about the raceway park, many of us have the images of Henry flying over those hills on smoking wheels, but it's a lot more than that. It's a lot more than that. It's created jobs. 
when you think of the, um, uh, what do you call the uh, drifters? My goodness, they burn up $1,000 worth of tires that are bought locally, and that puts money in somebody's pocket as they enjoy the raceway park. Uh, recently, and believe it, my oldest great-granddaughter is already in college. Three of my great-granddaughters and their dad, because their mom is in Afghanistan, were in those little, um, what do you call it, carts, uh, golf carts, whatever they are, those little carts out there. Side, side by side? Yes. Okay, side by side. Anyway, little carts, they look like golf carts to me out there. Uh, that's also going on out there. They were going through the jungle area of that, and so somebody is, I assume, making some money, which helps the people of Guam. And I s mentioned the build-up on Route 3 where I live. Uh, Forty years ago, one car, and I didn't know I was going to get down here on time, and, and I appreciate uh, Vice Speaker Nelson speaking first, give me a chance to think a little bit. Um, what a change it's been. And uh, during my five terms, I think most all with you, uh, Senator Atta, I was uh, fortunate enough to have over a hundred of my bills that I authored to become signed into law. That included the uh, building of uh, Machinano Elementary School under when Governor Guterres was governor and uh, under Governor Camacho, uh, Ukadu High School, uh, Astumbo Elementary, uh, Astumbo Elementary um, or Middle School, I guess, uh, Liguan and uh, Atacau, and many other bills that I felt were for the good of the people. Uh, when the school in Machinano or in a, um, were, was built, those kids, parents had to see their kids get on the bus in the morning to travel over 10 miles all the way to what then was called Anderson Air Force, uh, Anderson Elementary School, now uh, uh, the current name. And uh, that was awful, but for the good of the people of uh, Machinano, we were able to build a school there. Uh, as far as this racetrack goes, it also makes me recall, and believe it or not, you may not think it as you see me now, I used to be a long distance runner. And I uh, was president of the running club, did the Ironman a couple of times, Honolulu Marathon, and so on. I recall one evening running on foot near Two Lovers Point, heading down towards uh, Marine Drive. And it was uh, kind of dark already with four headlights coming straight at me. That was drag racing on that road going to Two Lovers Point. I don't run anymore, but if I were, I don't think I would see that at least not as much anymore. The, the raceway park has eliminated so much of that. And I recall over the years seeing the uh, families from the south working together on cars at home and being out there at the raceway park on the, on the events. And so I, I get around to my, the key to what I'm saying here, uh, speaker, uh, uh, chairman, senators, what is for the common good? I strongly support the land trust, but my goodness, what would happen if we don't get this lease extended? Where would all of this business go that would have to fold? Where would all these families go? Back out on the road that we'd see four headlights coming at us again? Um, and, and so I, um, I'm here this evening as Vice Speaker Ted Nelson said to support this effort uh, 100%. Twenty years ago, uh, there were a number of items in the bill that we passed, and I'm uh, very, very proud. Uh, when I first ra decided to run for office, my first term, I asked people, if I were to become elected, what would you want me to work on? And I bumped into Henry Simpson, and he talked about the need for a raceway park. And going back to the time when a couple of drivers were killed in what I think is a true place called Finnegogen, which we now call the Harmon uh, airstrip. That's where Finnegogen on the map is really. We're killed racing in there. And how many times have we seen cars racing? Uh, so for the common good, I, I ask and, and plead for you to please give this bill your um, most serious consideration. And if possible, as 
Vice Speaker Nelson said, uh, move forward and pass it. Fifty years will come and go like the last 40 some years when there was only one car every half hour on Route 3. Siju Samasi, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mr. Borja. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and Set Insurers. My name is Michael Borja. I'm the Director of the Department of Land Management and the Administrative Director of the Chamorro Land Trust Commission. And with me is Joey uh, Cruz, who is the Program Coordinator for the Chamorro Land Trust Commission. My commissioners do send their apologies because of prior commitments. They were unable to make it here today. On Bill Number 342, which seeks to authorize the Chamorro Land Trust Commission to enter a 50-year lease for Lot 7161R1 in Jigo, currently used as the Guam Raceway Park. It further grants the first right of refusal to the current licensee, the Guam Racing Federation. As you know, the current license agreement expired in June of this year, and the Chamorro Land Trust Commission had been in conversations with the um, Guam Racing Federation concerning this matter and in May of 20 of this year they recognized the importance of keeping this this raceway park open for the greater community needs and so they did pass a resolution um, in May of 2018 to extend this license agreement for a month-to-month -month, uh, on a month-to-month -month term for another year until I think the end of this year um, it was important for us to do this because we understood the needs to try and move forward with this. However, in looking over the bill, the commissioners on earlier, in a meeting earlier this month passed a motion requesting that there be modifications to this bill that includes that the conditions of the lease should comply with, with 21 GCA Chapter 75 on the commercial leases and licenses since the bill did not specifically authorize any specific terms um, for the lease and the lot area uh, that uh, that's to be leased um, should not be counted towards the CLTC commercial inventory because this property was re is really has been and continues to be if this bill passes to be designated by the legislature not by the Chamorro Land Trust Commission. Um, we understand the needs to move forward. We just want to make sure that in a in a a commercial lease agreement such as this, especially one that's, going to, that's being asked to go for 50 years, that the terms of those agreements either be codified in statute so that the terms of the agreement are, have full authority 20, 30, 40 years from now so we don't encounter any, any kind of issues with the, with the lease agreement moving on down the line. Um, and furthermore, we would also prefer if this lease agreement could be for a term of 50 years, but in two 25-year periods, and that way we can, we can examine something in a 25-year period to determine if uh, there are any adjustments that might, might need to be made at that point, or if the, the, lease, the lease lessee may want to terminate. But, on behalf of the Chamorro Land Trust Commission, those were their comments that they made by motion at their October 2 meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, before I dismiss the uh, uh, CLTC officials, um, does anybody have any questions? Although I would ask that we keep our questions brief um, uh, so that we can get to the other testimonies. Uh, there's a lot of people that have signed up. Uh, so maybe um, I'll go ahead and I'll start with the vice speaker. I should note I did receive, vice speaker, your, your, uh, your letter uh, asking for a, uh, a number of uh, information. Uh, and, and the committee will, after the hearing, of course, uh, make sure that we gather that information and make it a part of the uh, committee report. Um, and that I'm, I'm certain that after this hearing, we will have to get into a roundtable discussion to find uh, to um, sort out the uh, the finer points of of the bill and the details. But right now, all of the bill does is it does three things: one, it authorizes land trusts to enter into a 50-year uh, lease agreement because the law only allows them to get into a 25-year lease agreement. The second thing it does is it gives right of first refusal to the Guam Racing Federation, uh, which you have, if, uh, if you decide you have 30 days 
to exercise that right of first refusal. And the third thing is that really the negotiation is uh, left then to the Chamorro Land Trust uh, and Gita to work out the details of the lease. Um, and of course you have the Chamorro Land Trust commercial rules and regs uh, to guide those negotiations. Uh, but this, this hearing tonight is not going to be the end of, of this. We will have to go into a round table discussion. So with that, uh, Vice uh, Acting Speaker. I'm aware of the time restraints, Mr. Chair, so I'm just going to keep my questions short. I've asked for some information from several parties just to make sure. What I really want to look at is just um, what the bill we're looking at just is mm -hmm. we're going to approve a 50-year lease that's going to be negotiated outside of the legislature. So we have no terms before us, uh, so really no information as to what the purpose would be, what the uses would be allowed, and and my big thing I want to see is uh, the, what the terms are going to be in relation to mineral extraction, the removing of the coral and the topsoil and what, who's going to own that. And um, it's my understanding. Um, so I want to just know if CLTC has current um, plans that they looked at when they passed this resolution, plans for the, perp the use of this uh, park. Right, the Guam Racing Federation had, had attended uh, several different meetings for the Chamorro Land Trust Board of Commissioners and did present their visions of what they were looking to do moving forward. There was no action taken by the commissioners on any of those plans. Okay, that's because that's how we, that's kind of the status we're in at this point. Maybe, you know, these are the plans here, but we, we, we can't see any plans. We're not, we can't put our finger on what actually the, the new lease is going to look like. If it was just an extension of the old lease, that's very simple. We know the, the purposes that were allowed back then and everything, but at this point, we're, we're, we don't know those terms. All right. The, is the Chamorro Land Trust Commission up to negotiating a, a lease with? Well, we have entered into an MOU with the, uh, the Guam Economic Development Authority to work on commercial leases and licenses uh, with us. Um, but again, we just want to make sure that the authority that is granted to us is, could be reflected in the legislation, you know, uh, so that we can move forward in that. Otherwise, we may have issues in being able to get the, the lease approved as legal into form. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Castro? <laughs> Okay. Senator Lee, Senator Nelson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good evening, Mr. Borja. Um, the license agreement by Chamorro Land Trust dated June 1st, 1998. Has there been any updates to this specific license agreement? Um, this is what we received. Right. This um, is, that's what, that's all we have. No, there okay. hasn't been. So, um, I just want to, for the audience that is listening, to bring up on page six on the Chamorro Land Trust Agreement that it says licensee may alter their property in order to make it usable for the purposes stated herein. This alteration will include, but is not limited to, the removal of topsoil and or coral from their property. Recon recontouring the property and constructing appropriate facilities upon the property. 50% of the materials which are extracted from the par property or the value thereof shall be the property of licensor. If licensor desires to use them, those materials for other projects, licensee must make them available for such uses. If licensor does not desire to use the materials, licensee may sell the materials and deliver the proceeds to licensor for use by the license by licensor as is permitted under the Chamorro Land Trust Act. Licensor, if licensor so desires, licensee may create a credit on the book of the buyer in the name of Chamorro Land Trust Commission. Um, to date, um, we did write and inquire of the invoices um, for those specific transactions made with Hawaiian, Hawaiian Rock, Paris Brothers, and Smithbridge. However, we did not receive 
the invoices of the transaction, rather a printout of spreadsheet input, uh, which in my mind doesn't really validate the transaction being made. And so I'm asking, can you provide invoices for these transactions through these three businesses that the, I don't know who was in charge of the raceway, who the licensor was specifically that went into these contractual agreements with these businesses for this amount of coral for the past 20 years. And we all know that coral is very precious on our island. It's part of our development. And um, if we can get those documents, uh, is, do you have those documents? We received your Freedom of Information Act this afternoon, requesting that information, as well as the, the email you sent out yesterday, also asking for that information. Okay. At this time, I don't believe that we have any invoices. The matter of the extraction of the minerals from this area has been and was documented as a subject with the Office of Public Accountability Financial Audits done in 2012, 2013, and 2014, and 2015. And they were they were write-ups at those times. And so we worked with um, the Guam Racing Federation and with Hawaiian Rock to obtain all the documented information that was necessary to determine whether or not the amounts that were being paid in royalties for those, those extractions um, met what was actually taken out. In 2017, um, Guam Racing Federation brought in the, uh, a, a civil engineer who did an, a, a an outside assessment of the topographical changes of the facility compared to the um, amounts that Hawaiian Rock and Guam Racing Federation had, had dis determined to have been extracted. And at that time, they showed that there, I think there was roughly about a 6% variance of what was taken out um, versus what the topographical um, uh, evaluations showed. And they, they actually showed that that uh, more, I mean, less had been taken out than the, what they showed, but there's an issue of, of the compactness of the cubic yard in the ground versus the, the compactness of the cubic yard in a truck. So the com Board of Commissioners were satisfied at the time of, the, of that report that, that what had been reported by the Guam Racing Federation what, through a third party evaluation was satisfactory to them. And, um, in 2016, the, the issue of the extraction uh, write-ups from the public auditor was no longer there after 2016. Okay, thank you very much. And then the, just to reference the document that we received from um, the Guam Raceway Federation, uh, I'm sorry, it's a report to Chamorro Land Trust Commission by Guam Raceway Federation on February 15, 2018. Um, Hawaiian Rock, Paris Brothers, and Smithbridge, the total estimated cubic yard is, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm thinking that this is a dollar amount, $4,680,186. Is that, is that correct? No. It's in, what? it's in this document right here. That's the, it's the first page. Is that the money? You have the page? Where's that Smith, that big report with the uh, DCA? Oh, brain. I, um, and the I, reason I, why I'm asking this is I want to, I'm, I'd like to also additionally inquire, um, I'm understanding that Tomorrow Land Trust is supposed to receive uh, some of the proceeds. We did. Okay. We documented it. We put it in our financial reports. We reported it to the public auditor. They reviewed those to determine <laughs> That, what we had, that we had received those monies. And where did the rest of, how much did you receive? Is this the total for the, what period of time? This month, this month. So from 1999 to June 2016 when we quit, um, there was a total of two million one hundred and fifty thousand eight hundred and eighty two dollars and then the other two million went to well that was fifty our share fifty percent and then how did we track the other two million where, do we know where that went or we don't have privy over that 
No, the the license oh, agreement terms saying. are only fifty percent of the materials. Okay, so we don't know where the other half, the other fifty percent went. The Guam Racing okay. Federation. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Senator Sanagstein. Okay, uh, Senator Torres. Mr. Borja, uh, was the 50-year time frame a proposal that, that um, was discussed between Guam Raceway Federation and, um, and the Land Trust prior to the bill being introduced? I'm just trying to understand the 50-year period as the desired period. Uh, I don't think so. Okay. But you did, you did note, I thought it was interesting that you noted the um, breaking it up into increments where it would be subject to a review and, and uh, affirmation period after the 25-year mark. It would be similar to the same the, the, a license agreement that we have with the, uh, the golf course. Yes, okay. Thank you. I have no further questions. I think a lot of, of the, um, the questions that I had would be answered by Mr. Simpson's testimony anyways. So thank you. Thank you very much, Senator. Senator Munya? Uh, Senator St. Nicholas? Thank you very much. Okay, so with that, then I'm going to go ahead and dismiss the officials from uh, the Chamorro Land Trust Commission. And, Senator, thank you very much for your testimony tonight. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and start. According to the sign up here, I have uh, Henry Simpson, Jennifer Camacho, Harold Cruz, and Oscar Calvo. Um, we'll start with that. Um, we'll start with Mr. Simpson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Half a day, Chairman Ada, Vice Chairman Espold, all members of the committee. My name is Henry Simpson, and I would like to thank you very much for sponsoring this legislation. I've been involved with motorcycle racing since I arrived in Guam in 1967 at age 19. I went to work as a motorcycle mechanic the first week I arrived and was at the Harmon Drag Strip by the second week. There was only a population of about 60,000 on Guam at the time, and a lot of people would be at Harmon Drag Strip on Sunday afternoons. Unfortunately, deaths occurred at the drag strip, and it was shut down. Governor Guerrero at the time set aside 170 acres at Salisbury Junction and planned a new drag strip where safety would be enforced. Tourism was just starting, and it looked like Guam could afford to build a new track, but just as the plans were finished, the oil crisis of 1971 and 74 hit and plans were abandoned. At the same time, many motorcycle enthusiasts headed to the red dirt of Cross Island Road where they were welcomed by Jose and Herminia Calvo and family. In 1971, I started my first business selling Suzuki motorcycles and continued to race and promote racing at the Calvo track in Santa Rita. 1978 brought smoking wheels. The late John Chibato Camacho and I were approached about putting on a race that tobacco sponsors could promote. It was explained to us that auto racing was the largest spectator sport in the world and advertisers liked to sponsor races. 1979, we invited Malcolm Smith of On Any Sunday with Steve McQueen to Guam to race. He loved it and has returned many times. He will be back for our Smoking Wheels 40th anniversary this next year. In 1984, Governor Paul Calvo asked Chivato and I to sit on the Guam Grand Prix Racing Commission. The intent was to see if Tuman could hold a Grand Prix like Monaco and Macau on public streets. Our findings were that it could be done, but it was extremely expensive for something that we could only use once a year and very inconvenient to hotels and tourism. Our recommendation was that the government of Guam find a place for the Grand Prix where both tourists and locals could use it year round. Weekly racing and smoking wheels continued into the 90s, but we realized that sometime we would need to return the use of the land back to the Calvo family for their housing needs for their children and grandchildren, which is ongoing today. Soon we realized that dirt racing enthusiasts would suffer the same fate as drag racers 
and have no place to legally hold races and enjoy the sport. George Flores was president of the Guam Racing Association at the time, and he found Lot 7161 Jigo. It was Spanish crown lands and was too rugged to be economically used as a golf course. The Guam Racing Federation was formed to represent the voices of all the racers, including drag, street, sports car, drifting, dirt, motorcycle, bicycle, and others that wanted to join. In 1998, Senator Larry Kaspar introduced Public Law 24-141, allowing for $9 million in tax credits to build a raceway, and Governor Gutierrez signed it, signed it as part of his Way Forward plan. GRF was then granted a 20-year license. We suffered a few setbacks, such as loss of bleachers and fencing as Typhoon Pong Sanwa and a lack of contractors due to 9-11. But we got a lot of work done, and we're well on our way until the track was chosen as a part of the firing range in 2007. We stopped building and started looking for a new track site. We continued grading and joined others in opposing the pocket location until the decision was made to relocate the firing range to Northwest Field. In August 2015, the record of decisions selected Northwest Field as the final site, and we went back to work. In September 2015, we applied for a grading permit that we still have not received and are told we should receive soon. That brings us to today, where we are asking your support for our request for a 50-year lease on terms that will allow us to finish building the track to the point where the whole island can enjoy our first Guam Grand Prix. This 50-year lease will allow us to bring in other associated businesses to the raceway, such as a gas station for regular and racing fuels, warehousing for race cars, driving schools, and other associated ventures that will utilize the track for our tourists, hotel residents, and local residents, sorry, and military alike. You will see so many families here today that have grown together in racing at the old track, at the new track, and at home preparing their vehicles for races. Guam has a long and deep history of racing com com competitors, and it has brought out the best of those who compete. So again, we'd like to thank you for this opportunity and hope you can pass this bill. Was there a video that... Uh, we do have one, and I don't know where it went. Here it is. There we go. It's uh, hard to believe it's been 40 years since we had our first race. This track is a culmination of all of our years of putting on this race. This race kind of triggered us being able to have this facility out here. The, uh, the powers that, that be at the time we first started our races out at the Cross Island Road wanted us to work on a road race, a Guam Grand Prix for two months. And we studied that for a while, worked on it, and decided the island would be best served by a single location that could have motorcycle racing, off-road racing, drag racing, and the Guam Grand Prix. And so the idea for the Guam International Raceway was born. Yeah, we're Chuck and Christina Sawyer. We're from Houston, Texas, and we're here um, with some of my colleagues. One's from Oklahoma, one's from Texas, one's from Florida, and hopefully uh, we can have a good product for the judges. since we had our first race and it's been 20 years since we first started working on this track providing a, a quality of life for our military uh, folks that join us out here for uh, for racing 
it's uh, it's it's helping to keep a bad element off of the roads. It's uh, providing a a really great experience for a lot of young kids to get started in motorcycles, watch and team up with their dad to do uh, mechanics on the car they're racing, the bike they're racing, the different things that that uh, they're working together on. You can see a lot of father-son teams, a lot of brother teams, a lot of family teams are involved in this race. And that's the kind of thing we want to see this foster off into the future. Since shortly after its construction began in 2000, the Guam International Raceway has opened its gates to our island's motorsports enthusiasts in 2002. The Guam International Raceway has and is being enjoyed by so many and is treasured by all those who come out to drive, ride, race, and support. The park is truly a comfortable family park with organized riding and racing for all ages, all year round. International recognition of the events at the park, along with many of our local enthusiasts, has come from the hosting of such events as the annual Smoke and Wheels. This event has brought hundreds from around the world to participate and to enjoy the facility. The Guam International Raceway and Guam's beauty, along with its tropical climate, has made it an enthusiast's dream destination, proving that sports tourism works for Guam. Thank you very much. Okay, so that concludes your testimony. All right. Next, we have uh, Ms. Jennifer Camacho. Hoffaday. Great video. Nice to follow up with this. Um, Hoffaday Senator Ada and our dear senators of the 34th Guam Legislature, I thank you for allowing us the opportunity to be here today to voice our thoughts and support for Bill 342-34. You will see behind me and all around me members of our raceway community who in some shape or form utilize the beautiful land that has been so graciously made available to us through, of course, the Chamorro Land Trust Commission and to our previous legislatures. As you know, our lease for the Guam Raceway in Jigo has expired earlier this year and we've been on a month-to-month -month basis. I would like to first thank Senator, Mr. Chairman uh, Tom Atta, for taking the lead and proposing Bill 342, which is why we're all here today. As you can see, we are here in support of this bill and urge each one of you to support this bill, which not only gives a critical outlet needed for our community, but ensures our, our public safety of our streets and our lands. With this bill, our very diverse group of athletes, racers, children, tourists and enthusiasts will continue to have a home for so many different sporting events. As you've heard, Smoke and Wheels will be celebrating its 40th anniversary. All around me and behind me, you're gonna see the Drag Racing Association of Guam, Drift Guam, Guam Cycling Federation, Guam Women's Cycling, Guahan Jeeps, Guam Off-Road Adventures, Guam Visitors Bureau, Trench Challenge, Electric Island Music Festival, numerous motorcycle learn to rides for children and adults, mountain bikers, little striders, and parents who utilize the raceway to teach their teenager how to drive. The list can go on. If you look around here today, you will see first, second, third, and even fourth generations of racers. Someone asked me recently what this raceway means to the average citizen who perhaps doesn't use the raceway. And the first thing that comes to mind is public safety. As a resident of Jigo, I utilize the back road to Anderson every single day. And having this raceway means that I can drive home safely, not worrying about illegal drag racers. As an early morning runner, I utilize the, the road to Two Lovers Point. And like the Senator Casper Bauer mentioned, we no longer have to worry about illegal drag racing on those roads at odd hours. As a Southern girl whose family still lives down South, I don't have to worry about Polaris Point turning into an illegal drag strip because of this Guam Raceway. This raceway provides a safe and reliable facility for our community. 
We depend on this raceway, and we urge you to support and say yes to Bill 342-34 so many more generations can live their passions and do so safely. Senator Tom Mata, I thank you again. I thank you, uh, Madam Speaker, and to all our senators that are here today that took the time to be here. Thank you for hearing all of us. Thank you very much. Uh, next on the list is uh, Mr. Harold Cruz. Test. Half, half, half a day. Half a day, Honorable uh, Chairman Thomas Atta and members of the Committee on Land. I appear today before you and the committee to support Bill 34 cor an act authorizing the CLT CLTC to enter into a 50-year lease with the Guam Racing Federation to continue to operate and develop the Guam Raceway Park. Mr. Chairman, I, re I remember over two decades ago when the idea of the lease came before the Commission. It was only a few years earlier when the CLT CLTC rules were championed by the late Senator Angel L.G. Santos in the 23rd Guam Legislature. I think you're the only senator that was part of that uh, sitting, sitting here uh, before us today. There wasn't a single lease signed by a qualified applicant back then. So one wondered how the CLT CLT CLTC can grant a lease while thousands of families were still waiting. Nevertheless, with some resistance because of, because of the vision of our leaders and activists, the lease was granted. I strongly believe that the signing of the lease almost 20 years ago was a wise and fruitful decision. But even more, prior to the construction of the Guam Raceway Park, our leaders in the 10th Guam Legislature and the 13th Guam Legislature provided some kind of funding to build a racetrack or a, a drag strip some vision our, our leaders had back, going back as far as the 10th Guam Legislature. Fast forward to today, to today and there has been much progress in the issuance of residential and agricultural leases by the CLT, CLTC. And although I personally feel we could do more, it's been my personal experience that our island and our people, Chamorros, Gomenians, friends from other countries and tourists, the development of the Raceway Park has far exceeded the vision of our, of our leaders. Guam has the potential of becoming a mecca for off-road and racing developers. So Mr. Chairman, as leaders and members of this great nation, we have a very difficult decision. Or maybe for some of us, it's not so difficult. Do we grant the 50-year lease or do we say no to the lease and subdivide the property in question and issue it out to qualified applicants? That's pretty much a moral question. Mr. Chairman, this will probably be my first and only time when I take a position or what, my, what some might say is a controversial, controversial topic. Having met with the organizers of the Raceway Park Mr. Simpson and Jeff Rios, and having reviewed and studied the future plans and development, having been a competitor in the Mudbog event, having been a spectator and taking my three kids to numerous events at the Raceway Park, and having watched my own daughter be a part of the rate of a, of a racing pit crew, I come before you and I say, I'm here in full support of the intent of Bill 342-34. The public good is equal, if not always, the individual benefit. So Mr. Mr. Chairman, I do have several, several recommendations to the bill. One, that a section be added to the bill that identifies that all funds paid by the Guam Raceway Park to the CL2, CA, CLTC be deposited into an account that will strictly be used to survey 
and provide basic infrastructure for future and current CLTC lands. Second, that the CLTC conduct an administrative review of the development and progress of the Guam Raceway Park at least every seven to 10 years and report such findings to the people of Guam and the Guam Legislature. In closing, Mr. Chairman, I remember competing in the first mud bog event. The feeling of competing in an official sanctioned event was great. I'm being told that the Guam Raceway Park is home to more than 10 diverse user groups, including cyclist clubs, run and walk events, obstacle course events, concerts, car shows, echo tours, off-road tours, and even EVOC training for our law enforcement community, motocross, drag racing, drifting, and auto X. There are more than 100 event days per year with events taking place day and night. All these events involve friends and families, while some of these events and others have attendance of the measure in the thousands. Over 50,000 people have visited the Raceway Park each year, and every year this number grows. GR, Guam Raceway users and fans are intensely loyal. They support the local economy, and over the past 20 years, the Guam Raceway organization has proven to be a family-oriented and serves as an alternate sports tourism outlet. Again, I appear and I wholeheartedly support the passage of this legislation under a 50-year lease agreement. That includes Jesus Masi. Harold, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Cruz. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I will submit my testimony in writing. Yes, please. Thank you very much. You. And the same with you, uh, Mrs. Camacho. All right. Um, Mr. Calvo. Um, good evening, Mr. Chairman and Senators. Um, Today I come in support of this bill, but before I begin how this thing really started off was where it all began. I was in Hawaii a couple of a week, and Henry calls me about this bill coming up. I was going for medical and so forth, and he said, man, I need your help. I said, what for? I said, man, Henry, I'm over here in Hawaii. I'm being medically changed. So I finally, I got to go back again to finish up what I'm you know, I'm going for my medical issues. But where it all began, um, when years ago, when this started out, one day we were out in the ranch with me and my brother Rick, the late brother of mine, and my dad, and we had a couple of bike riders riding around. And my dad said, do you know this is private property? And bike riders said, no, we didn't know. I thought everybody can come and ride. So the Bike riders at the time said, you think we can ride? And my dad, and you know this for a fact, Tom, that my dad and my mom is, you know, one of the most nicest person in the world too, and loving. So my dad said, yeah, you can ride, but just make sure, you know, we have plants and animals that we have around here. So it started that way, and as we were driving out, I asked my father, I said, dad, didn't you just give these guys an authorization to ride here? And he says, son, where are they going to ride? Where are they going to go? We got this big stake of land, okay? Let them use it. We're not going to be doing much about it at this point in time. So it started that way, and then it started to grow. The bag riders started coming over, the organization, John... Uh, like Henry Simpson and these guys, organization, and they came and asked my father. My dad gave out 60 acres of property at no cost, didn't charge the, the, the organization, not a penny. For 25 years, for 25 years, he let them use this land. Even when they had open sessions, racing, the first international race that was held there, you know, and I got to meet all these famous rider that Mr. Simpson brought over, and then I got involved riding myself. My sons got involved, and other people got involved. So it grew. Then they started to do, have night races. 
but it was an all an effort of the writers, you know, because like my father said, Pamano na isti siya, boy, na pa fang karera, okay? Guaha dong kulun tanota, bala da tanai, you know? So, so we did, and we sat down with Henry and, and other, uh, the association, and they started, and they worked hard for it. They had organization coming in, Black Construction, Paris Brothers, they were there on weekends, you know, cutting down trees and so forth. So when that, I say where it begins, because that's actually where the smoking wheel started back then, and, and then it grew up. So when it was time for us, our, my family decided to start building, and you know, so my brothers and sisters say, hey, man, I want to build. My, my niece said, I want to build in there, and all these things encumbers. So I told Henry, I said, man, it, you know, we need, so at the Tomorrowland Trust, they were granted with, with, uh, Vice Speaker um, Castor Bowers, so it transpired that they can go ahead and move up to to uh, Jiggle. So going back to that, I support this view for for the, the things that these guys have put together. A lot of these guys didn't know where did really smoking wheel really started out. 25 years ago, my mom and my dad never charged a penny. The only time we charged them was at the end of the year for the property tax. And that was it. That was it. Even when they have concessions, when they have races, we could have had, you know, an opportunity and say, hey, we, let's run the, the concession. But, you know, my dad and my mom said, Polo said that Mancita, said these guys, they're not getting paid as a pro, okay? So whatever money they they pull in in the concession or whatever, that was their price for these guys. And some of them like making like maybe what, 200, 150, 200 dollars to race. And they build all these machinery, you know, to make their, their cars look nice. So, and I'm glad you brought that about, about the material. When they were doing up in Jigo and they had the first track race, my mom's spirits still lasts up there. And we said, Oscar, I said, what? We need dirt. I said, what do you mean you need dirt? I said, you got dirt up there? He said, man, it's all coral up there. It's all coral up there. I said, so what they did, about maybe a thousand loads of dirt from the original part of the track, they brought it up there. So at no cost again, we just gave them, you know? So I'm asking you senators to support this bill, you know? You couldn't have said it better than Vice Speaker uh, Nelson. Just, just pass and get it over with. But I know there are other issues that you need to. And I was also a part of the Tomorrow Land Trust back then. You see, I was the chairman of that. And when these things were happening, and we, you know, what I saw their plans, you, you know, how they were going to build the Grand P and all these things. So I did all this. So I want to just give these thoughts to you guys. That's where the smoking wheel, um, you know, began. And here, I have here, I was going to read all these things, but I got too much to read here, so I think I'd rather come, let it come out of my own. And, um, but I'll show you guys all this. And I, and I applaud all the bike riders here, and especially Mr. Simpson and all the supporters. We need to pass this bill. I mean, I was talking to um, Mr. Boer earlier, you know, they don't have an objection to this. I don't think so. Right, Mike? Anyway, so let's just pass this bill. Senators, have a good day. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and call up the next panel. Does anybody have questions? You have a question for Mr. Simpson? Mr. Simpson? Senator Castro has a question for you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Thank you. You know, uh, before the bodies, there's a question of 50 years and 250 acres. And just in full disclosure, I met with Mr. Simpson uh, not once but three times uh, to ascertain for myself to determine what really is behind the question of 50 years and 250 acres. And it was when you provided me with this copy of a 1979 publication. And I got to tell you, 
that the video you presented, and I, I'm going to maybe allude to this, the visual aid you provided today, uh, suggests a much grander vision. And I want to commend you and the families that are involved, namely the Calvo family from Cross Island Road. But never, never until I met with you would I have envisioned this mutter competition or I think you do mountain biking, you do hiking, you do drifting, you do all of that. And so I only have, I have a lot of questions, but I'll reserve it for the round table. And so I want to publicly commend uh, Senator Ada for introducing the bill as written. Uh, and I support the bill, but I want to ask you two questions. The first question is, is a track currently sustaining itself? And the second question is, uh, you know, in my support of this grander vision, how do you plan or how does the Guam Racing Federation intend on financing flushing out that master plan as depicted on the far right visual aid? If you could share some of your ideas. Thank you very much. The, um, the uh, need for a 50 year lease um, is so that we can entice other businesses to join us there at the track. And one prime example is a gas station. We need a gas station that can supply racing fuels, uh, can supply the different types of fuels that are needed in racing and lubrication and things. And so, but it would also need to be able to serve the public. And there's a certain amount of time. It's typically 35 years to 50 years that they want in order to invest in building a uh, permanent station and something like that. And so that's one of the, one of the reasons for the uh, request for 50 years. The, when we first started this out, we had an estimate of $9 million to build the, to build the track. And it, it turned out to be quite a bit more than that because the property was fairly unforgiving as far as, uh, as far as the, the, the way the site was set up for what we needed to build. It had a, had a huge hill right in the middle of it. There was no room for a uh, permanent drag strip. Uh, and, and actually, when you see the plans, we have what's a temporary drag strip, one that we could find the flattest area possible and build that track so that we could have a place for our local racers to, to go to, that we would have a drag strip that could work until we could build a permanent drag strip. The, uh, one of the uh, National Hot Rod Association, which is a sanctioning body for hot rodding for drag strips, required that we have a 4,000 foot flat and level strip. What we have in our temporary is 3,300 feet with the last 600 feet kicked up at an angle, which allows us to run cars up to 200 miles an hour. So in order to take that into the future, we need to build one that has 4,000 feet flat and level, and that's our intention and our next step with this. So out of the $9 million that we are given for tax credits, we've used 7.2 up until the year 2007, and 2007 was when the uh, record of decision was, uh, was, uh, came through and, and we didn't know uh, what would happen to the, to the racetrack. We, you know, we were told a lot of things. That first was, don't worry, there's, gonna, you know, there's a lot of money here and we're gonna take care of it, but it took a while for us to figure out that there was nothing really set aside for the track. And so uh, we joined others and, uh, and, and finally the, uh, the firing range was moved to Northwest Field. But it set us, aside, set us back uh, at least the seven years until 2015 when the record of decision for the, for the firing range at uh, Northwest Field came out. And then we had some uh, in the meantime, the fatting tree had become endangered, and we had quite a few fatting trees there that were being attacked by a by a insect. And then also the Mariana eight spot butterfly had a place in the in the racetrack area. So it's taken us over three years to get a grading permit, and we've been through the federal forestry, federal EPA, local EPA. Um, and, and it's, it's, it's been a long, long process to get to 
start work again to where we can get going, where we can start working again. So the future is going to be we're going to need uh, we're going to need those investments like gas stations, like warehousing for race cars, like uh, uh, repair areas for that can do local and race cars, things that are involved around the racetrack that helps us maintain and take care of the place. But we, we will probably come back and ask for more money to help finish building the Formula 3 track. The Formula 3 track is kind of our crown jewel of this whole, uh, of this whole plan. And it's actually where the racetrack pays back the government for its investment in this type of, uh, in this type of, uh, of uh, racetrack. Because if we can do one and possibly two Formula 3 Grand Prix on Guam, the amount of people that come in separately for that kind of tourism will pay back the government and taxes and all the other uh, auxiliary generated uh, income that is around that kind of uh, around that kind of venture. So, the uh, the it's, it's really a it's really a bonus in that everything we're doing as we build it keeps our people safer, gives everybody a chance to uh, use the track, and then as we build the Formula Three track and get to where we can uh, actually hold that Guam Grand Prix, uh, then you know, we've worked something good along the whole thing and get the payback at the end. So we get paid back a little bit along the way and we get a big payback at the end. So to answer your question, we're going to need more financing in the future, but this is the, the right start is to get a, a good 50-year lease that we can start, we can entice in other investors in, we can work with other people and generate more income for the racetrack. Thank you, Mr. Simpson. Just one more request. If I can uh, request for a copy of the same yes. uh, to be shared with the rest of the senators. Senator Joe wanted my copy, but I have all kinds of scribbles on it, so thank you. Uh, in a nutshell, basically, Mr. Simpson in our prior meeting uh, shared with me some prior publications as far back as 2001, and I couldn't agree more with former Governor Gutierrez and then Vice Speaker Casper Bauer on the potentiality of this enterprise to be a major, major stimulus to the economy, to diversify the economy. So thank you, and I'd like that to be submitted for the committee report. Yes, I'd like to also give you the uh, copies of the, uh, of the 1979 uh, brochure that we had for Smoking Wheels. And there's a lot of nostalgia there, and a lot of the kids that are here, or a lot of the people that are here were kids back then. <laughs> There's always, there's always been a lot of, of uh, support amongst the, amongst the government, amongst the political factions. It's almost always been uh, a joint effort by the various groups to try and get this done. But it's like anything else. It runs across funding. It runs across... Um, operational it runs across different problems that have to be worked with until you get the until you get the final product finished and so um, the guy that's designing the racetrack for us he's designed racetracks in Australia he's designed racetracks in China he's de designed racetracks all around Asia and he said this is the longest racetrack he's ever designed and he said not the longest in length but the longest it's taken to build it but he said we're we're uh, he wants us to keep persevering and get it built he thinks because of our location next to the ocean that on television this racetrack would look outstanding if you can imagine a tv camera following a race car with the with the background of the pacific ocean and the uh, and, and he, he said it would be an outstanding, one of the most beautiful racetrack areas in the world. Okay, thank you very much. Senator Snogstein. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Henry, we go back over four decades when I was in the police department, I rode your Suzuki bikes. But, um, and you know, I support the, the racetrack, thank point you. blank. 
No doubt about it. I even got the shirt. So we're good. <laughs> what my concern is about is you talked about money. You're going to need some funding. And, and you know, the, the, the Guam legislature has passed laws that have given tax breaks for folks that build roads for, for our, the people of Guam to travel. I'm concerned that how much, if you were looking for funding, would you be considering asking the Guam legislature to maybe find a way to give tax breaks so that we can help the racetrack get on its feet so that when you start asking other businesses to get involved, they can start writing it off. They can actually speed up the process a little bit faster. Would you be considering that? I mean, because we're going to have a round table, Henry, on that one. So that I would, just that would be a good one. First, first, first of all, <laughs> let me make it clear. I made it very clear to Mr. Simpson that this bill is simply to authorize CLTC yes. for a 50-year lease. Okay. So basically it comes down to get into the house first, then you can talk later about how you're going to arrange the furniture. Okay. okay. Thank you, and Mr. So Chairman. we're going to limit our discussion yep. as to justifying the 50-year lease. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. So, Vice Speaker. Thank you. Thank you all for your testimony and uh, Mr. Simpson. I, I do. I, I have a couple. Um, I too, you know, was one of probably the teenagers growing up at the racetrack. <laughs> now I see everybody is we're old, but uh, that was down in Santa Rita. Yes. Good. But. Um, and, and there's no doubt. I have no um, issue with any of the testimony so far that has said all the benefits of the activities that's go that are going on there and even the proposed activities. And um, I, I, you know, I'm especially concerned about the safety issues because I think where I live in Jotnia, I hear drag racing all night long. It's still a, a concern, I think, in that area. But... Um, so I know it's good for, you know, tourism, our, our economy, our current businesses, our, uh, and safety. I, I do think, though, that, you know, this transaction that we're being asked to approve is, I mean, we're really not approving any terms except for 50 years, a 50-year lease. And so a 50-year lease to me is way beyond our current policy of, you know, five years. That's what we, we're, you know, that's kind of our standard policy so far, except for with Chamorro Land Trust. Chamorro Land Trust is authorized to give 21-year leases. And uh, so they could, I would think, um, without coming here, um, grant, an, you know, a new 21-year lease or license as just very similar to how they, you know, do their other commercial licenses. But... Um, but it, it sounds to me like they're not doing that, and I'm guessing here, because they want some additional terms to be put in there, but, but the bill has none. And, and so the senator's very clear. He's only going to say 50 years, and then he's going to give the authority to Gita and the Chamorro Lantras to pretty much set all other terms. And to me, I feel like that's just... Um, uh, it doesn't sound prudent to me as a senator. I feel like that's part of our job. If we're going to give a 50-year lease, we should have all the details, all the details in front of us as much as possible so that, so that the public in 50 years knows that we considered what the impact was and, and you know, everything and that we agreed to that. And kind of there are no surprises for, for you know, the government or for the public. Um, so for me, that's why I'm looking for a little bit more detail, and that's why I ask about the plans, and I'm curious whether the plans are the same, because I've read all, uh, a bunch of documents, and I just want, I really want to determine if the plans were the same at the beginning of that 21-year license as they are now, or whether these plans are for an expansion of the purpose under, you know, beyond what was intended under that original 21-year lease. I also want to know... <clears throat> um, you know, what the CLT sees, the, in order to do a commercial license, they're supposed to make a declaration that they don't need this property for their residential leases. And, you know, we've heard all the news. I think there are still thousands of people waiting, so I just want them, I feel like they need, their, their resolution's pretty brief. It doesn't really discuss that at all. Uh, the impact of this in the future. I mean, what is their plan? Are they planning to take it back in 50 years and then build, you know, residential houses on it or not? And um, 
If, if not, I mean, I just think they should make that very, very clear. Um, I think the terms that Gita is going to negotiate, we, we should be aware of. Uh, if, if you guys um, have all of that, you know, already planned out, then I just feel like then that's what we should be reviewing and approving. I also, um, it's a little bit different too from the CLTC's commercial license, uh, the way they do their current commercial licenses where they, it's competitive bidding. This one would be f right of first refusal and this bill does that, um, which I, I really don't object to that part um, necessarily. Just, just I feel like we should though know what we are approving, right? If, if we're going to give you right of first refusal, then we should know what's your plan. What, what is your plan for this property? And because we're going to be taking it away from the availability for residential leases, right? Um, and also because, yeah, you, you brought this up and I was going to bring this up too. When, the, uh, when they wanted to use, you know, um, nearby properties or this property for firing range, yeah, there were issues brought up regarding the environment. And so I want, that's why I'm very curious about the plans, if these are an expansion of the original purpose, if, this, if these impacts uh, go beyond what we already know of the, you know, the property, or is it going to um, involve more impacts to the neighboring limestone forest where you know, we've got these endangered species, or is it going to involve additional grading? I mean, re removal of the mineral, uh, I would like to know that, and um, I'm, I'm, I want to be sure that the Chamorro Land Trust is able to enforce the provisions. I think they're they're definitely doing their work, and um, but there were for many years past audit findings that they were not able to enforce even the original license, right? The provisions of that, and so I want to make sure that if if we're going to allow them to be the one to negotiate and to approve a lease that they are able to enforce it because we're putting it all in their hands to enforce that and, and they've had some issues. Oh, and could you just repeat, of the nine million in tax credits, how much has been used already? You said there's a balance. Yes, out of the nine million, uh, 7.2 million has been used. Okay. All right, and then finally, just, uh, yeah, I, I've asked these in the documents, so I'll wait for the round table for the, for the details, okay. but I, I just want to see the grading because while I, I agree with all the purposes of the track, I, I, I don't like to see all the grading of the land because I, I, I want to know what the impacts are from that grading. I want to know uh, if it's absolutely necessary for the purpose that's intended or um, just because, yeah, I want to just put some kind of parameters to make sure there's not uh, excessive, you know, grading for, yeah. for just for speculation purposes or for profit. And, and I don't think uh, that's the purpose of this lease in the beginning. I, I'm sure that was not the intent. And so I just want to put some protections down for that. Oh, thank you very much. You. Anybody else have any comments? Um, Senator Lee. And then Senator Nicholas. Senator Masi, Mr. Chair, and thank you so much, Mr. Simpson, and everybody who's already provided testimony. I think it's extremely important for our community to be a part of the decision-making process and to really help to inform all of us, um, especially in the way that you use the Raceway Park, in the way that it has impacted your families and, and impacted our entire island community. Some of the things that we were hearing is, you know, just about safety and making sure that our, our families are safe, our community is safe. Um, and also the economic benefit, jobs, sports tourism that the Raceway Park has brought to our island, and we're really grateful for that. Um, Mr. Simpson, one question that I had was brought forward by, I believe Mr. Cruz um, had made a suggestion in terms of changing what's currently being proposed, a 50-year lease, into two separate 25-year lease periods. And I wanted to know, I get some feedback from you on that proposal. The, um We'd much rather have the longer term so that planning can be long term. Uh, we could, uh, we could, you know, I, I, I can't honestly answer what the impacts would be at this time, but I know that, that uh, uh, 
people that I've talked to about putting a fueling station wanted a fairly long-term lease. And people that want to invest in, in building buildings and things like that typically want a longer term. And the ability to, the ability to uh, uh, have, let's say, a 30-year lease with a, with a 10-year renewal uh, to be able to give somebody that kind of a of a of a lease uh, that we're because we're we're looking forward to subleasing parts of this to associated businesses, driving schools, uh, warehousing for race cars, things like this. People that will invest their money in the racetrack for a return because they're also interested in racing and they want to be able to make money at it. Thank you very much. Um, one of the comments that you had made in your response to Senator Castro was about the Formula 3 track. Yes. And um, you anticipating holding Grand Prix events there. Yes. And you had mentioned that, you know, this would help to repay Gov Guam back um, in tax revenue and some of the sti economic stimulus. And yes. so that's one thing that I'm really, really looking forward to hearing back maybe in the round table. And I'm grateful yes. to the chairperson for, yeah. you know, allowing us that opportunity to kind of look at those um, important details. Um, I wanted to ask you if you have in relation to this bill and in, in other work, like what is your working relationship with the GIGO mayor and the municipal planning council of GIGO? They've been very supportive of the racetrack and, uh, uh, it's it's something that's been welcome to the village as a as a uh, as a uh, good good participating portion of the of the village. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask about your nonprofit status. Um, if you're able to provide um, some of that information for, for the committee, that would be helpful for us in yes. going forward. Yeah. And again, I just want to thank you very much for coming forward and for all of your work in the community. Thank you. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Chair. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Senator Lee. Senator St. Nicholas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I fully support the, um, the track, um, the, good, the good things that are done, the, uh, the safety concerns that are addressed. I think it's all very good for our community. Um, my only question is that the, what the bill also does is it grants a right of first refusal specifically to the Guam Racing Federation. And so it's not just authorizing a lease for a track, but it's also um, authorizing who's going to be able to operate it for the next 50 years. And so uh, in line of that, I would like to request if we could have the consolidated revenue and expenditure reports of the organization to be able to review um, how the, uh, what monies came in, how that money was spent. Because when we pass this bill, we're, we're not only going to be you know, committing for 50 years of a track, but we're also going to be committing to an additional 50 years of how that track is going to be operated. And I just want to be able to see the, uh, the financials on how the, uh, the current operations have been thus far, okay. if I could request that. We, we have audited statements so, for the past years. Okay, if, we could just, uh, if that could just be provided to, to the committee for us to also consider. Yes. Thank yeah. you so much. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Senator. All right, there are no other questions for Mr. Simpson. I'm going to go ahead and call up the next uh, okay. list of people. Thank you very much, Mr. Simpson. I have a Marie Camacho here, but you didn't indicate whether you were going to give oral testimony. Marie Camacho? Okay. Um, Mr. Ron Titano? Uh, Ms. Evelyn Santos? Um, Mike Limtiaco, Senator Limtiaco? Uh, Lester Carlson. Uh, Donna, Ter Donna Terlahi. Tommy Affligui. Uh, Frank Florick. Can they hear out there? Can they hear out there the names that are being called? Frank Florick, uh, Clarissa Paris. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, these people listed. These people listed that they are in favor, uh, but they did not indicate that they were going to give oral testimony. So we have Frank Florick, Tina uh, Conker, Clarissa Paris, Yoshi 
Carr, Lee Weber, uh, Robert Conker, and Eugene Carm. Uh, they are all in favor. Uh, Robert Steffi, Sherry Sampson, Ron McNinch in favor. Uh, Eddie Cruz, uh, Mr. Cruz, did you want to give oral testimony? Dr. McNinch, you signed up, but did you want to give oral testimony? Um, Eddie Cruz, you signed up to give oral testimony. So we'll go ahead and uh, after we finish with this panel, uh, we'll go to the next sheet. We'll start with uh, Senator Limtiaco. Uh, thank you, Chairman Ada and the senators of the 34th Guam Legislature. Uh, my name is Michael Limtiaco, and I am here to testify in support of the bill. Um, I testify as an enthusiast, a motorcycle enthusiast who's grown up uh, his whole lifetime racing. I can't believe that I actually know Henry when he was in his 20s. I was only eight years old, um, but I, I competed in the sixth annual Smoking Wolves when I was 10. So I remember when we were growing up, there was no place on the island to ride except on people's private property. And that still exists today other than the raceway. So if you think of all the areas that all of the members here or all the enthusiasts currently um, go about, you know, uh, enjoying their four-wheelers or motorcycles, you think of areas like Tank Farm, private property, Channel 10, private property. The Calvos were gracious, en gracious enough to let us use their land for so long but that was private property. Dundon, where the lids on landfill right now, where a lot of people grew up riding private property. So when you, when you think about the Guam Raceway Park, it's really the only place that the government is allowing us to, you know, ride our motorcycles or ride our four-wheelers. Um, think of, I, I know that several legislatures have gone through environmental impact roundtables to erosion control to see what it's doing to the aquifers, to, you know, to see that the erosion is going into our rivers and is causing you know, uh, that you know, brackish water to wash out into our coral reefs and kill coral. You don't have that issue so much up in the raceway because it's, co it's contained. Um, and um, it's an area where you know, many before me have testified about safety. Um, when you go up to the raceway, there's very specific rules and regulations and safety standards that are required. You're required to read the rules and regs. You're required to sign waivers. And everybody self-enforces each other on making sure that they wear the appropriate racing gear, that they have helmets on, that they have protective gear on. That doesn't happen when, when there's uh, places that are unregulated, you know, throughout the, the island to race. So, you know, a lot of you have... Uh, express concerns about safety this is a really big issue because without an organized racing area you're going to have people not properly you know ready to do these sports and they can get injured and in some cases killed i remember growing up in high school uh back road was very popular amongst you know our uh all of us we, we all knew what happened up there there was drinking and there was drag racing and those two things they, they don't work well together I, I know a lot of my friends and, and their friends have lost their lives or been injured doing things like that. And this raceway provides a very organized, very safe environment to do that. So, you know, then you, then you think about the pedestrians on the road, too, and how they're affected by it. You know, the runners, the bicyclists, and we all have seen in the paper how many bicyclists have been killed. And, and they're not, you know, we're not talking about um, people drag racing. We're just talking about people just driving on the road. So, you know, to have the mountain bikers out there utilizing the facility where there's no, you know, traffic to impede their, their progress and to, you know, to run them over, um, it's a good thing. How the legislature chooses to go about making sure it's a win-win for the government and the uh, enthusiasts and the, the community, you know, that's what, um, that's what the public hearings are for. That's for you to take onto session floor and debate and, and make the bill better. Um, by putting in your input and making it a win-win. I'm sure that somewhere in there, um, you as our leaders can come up with a viable solution where the enthusiasts can use the racetrack, the government can benefit from it as well, 
in, in various forms that many speakers before me have talked about. Um, and I, I kindly ask you to support the bill. You know, take the testimony from the public hearing today and, you know, debate it on the floor and make it a better bill. And please figure out a way to keep the raceway. Thank you very much for the testimony. Thank you very much, sir. Senator Lamteoko. Uh, Dr. McNinch. Thank you, Senator Atta and, and honorable senators. Uh, I have just a couple of very brief comments. First, uh, Senator Atta, I have to say, everyone's going to miss you when you're going to leave the legislature, and it's a, a, an honor and pleasure, certainly, to uh, give this <coughs> testimony. Probably the last time, last time I'm going to give you testimony for a while, but certainly please uh, consider joining the legislature again in the future. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, Senators, I want to speak in favor. I think your testimony is over. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. No, uh, Senators, I want to speak in favor of this bill. I just want to briefly comment that the raceway and everything it does brings a sense of community to Guam. And I think that that sense of community is very apparent here. I think that uh, the members are, are very active and, and there's a great public benefit both for the current users of the raceway park and certainly their children. And there are multiple uses of the park uh, beyond those of just motoring and things like that. Uh, they use it for other things. And so certainly, uh, in a way, I view the Raceway Park genuinely as a Guam park. That is, it's a place for the community, it's a place for people to go and enjoy our, our wonderful environment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Senator Tiako, is this the next generation of racers here? Uh, yes, actually. And, you know, one of the things that I, I've completely felt to mention was um, I spent at least 50% of my life at the, uh, the Calvo uh, Raceway up in Santa Rita. Um, I remember staying there to the wee hours of the uh, evenings on Saturday and Sunday. That's all we did, and it was a very big community of people that did it. But, you know, I was a mischievous child. This kept me out of trouble, you know? So, you know, being, like most sports do, right? They teach kids discipline. They teach them, you know, uh, how to lose graciously, how to win graciously. Um, and um, it's one of the reasons why my son here, Leo, I have him active in the sport as well. He's six. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of new technology, so he wears everything possible to protect him. But it's going to keep him out of trouble, too, like most sports do. And that's why a lot of parents, you know, can, can link success in school. They can link success, success in life. To sports and that's because of the discipline it imposes on him but yeah he's uh he's six and he's gonna you like racing yeah so there you go thank you all right thank you very much mr cruz thank you senator i want to thank all of you guys first for considering listening to us the general public um listening to everybody that originally was part of the grandiose uh plans and everything was uh, brought me back to reality to think about where we were many years ago when the bill was first introduced to allow the, the construction of the park and the use of uh, basically public funds in the way of tax rebates and abatement. And I just thought about what the value was of this racetrack and where we had been there back in that day with all the accidents and all the mischievous things and the crime and everything. And I remember sitting for many years with a police statistician looking at the, the crime rates and, and things that how creating the racetrack removed some of those, reduced them. Um, many people don't know, but I, uh, I was the culprit that started the Marine Drive drags with Governor uh, Ricardo Jerome Verdayo, right in front of the boat basin. Uh, and it started off, we asked him, because we wanted to show um, how there was a need for, uh, to have a track to take the kids off the streets. And it was that that kind of uh, set me thinking and, and set my, my position to try to fight for something like that. Because I had gone to college in the States and I had learned how to drag race. I learned how to race just about every form of racing I could get my hands in that I could afford. Fortunately enough, drag racing was probably one of the cheapest because I could take a family vehicle and race it. So fast forward to around 1998 when 
A lot of us joined forces, uh, Albert, late Albert Pobletti and myself with Henry Simpson and some of the other people, uh, Senator Casper Bauer. And we went around and we asked people if they would support a racetrack. And uh, one of the things was, would they support a drag strip? And so we did. We went out and, and we educated the public that illegal drag racing was not the way to go, that it was very dangerous, that we would create a place where they could come and have an enjoyment as a community, um, and there would be a benefit to the public. So for the next 12 years of my life, I basically set aside my businesses, uh, my farm, my lifestyle, so to say, and we ran the drag strip. I had a very good team. For many years, uh, we had an event every weekend, sometimes two or three events in a weekend. And everybody knows of volunteers, it's very tough to do. But there were a lot of it, very dedicated people there. Not only my staff, but the community who came out, and a lot of them weren't even racers. They came out to support the, the, the event. It was a cheap place, they could go for a dollar. And sometimes I'd pull money out of my pocket to pay their fee to get into the track. Because we knew we had to pay Chamorro Land Trust Commission a fee based on our agreement between the Drag Racing Association of Guam and the Guam Racing Federation. So I could safely say that out of the 12 years I was there, we definitely were a benefit to the quality of life on Guam. Now, I want to just speak briefly on something else because something that a lot of people don't know. Between about 2003 and 2008, I had a big military community that also came on board. And during that time, there was a lot of friction between the military and the locals. So we used that as a positive. We created basically racing teams that, that competed against each other. In 2007, a publication came out from, I believe it was the US Navy MWR. And it was published, if I'm not mistaken, the Stars and Stripes. And it said that Guam was a leading destination for people that were looking for overseas duty in the United States Navy. And one of the things, amongst others, uh, amongst diving and, and the warm weather and everything, was drag racing. Because apparently, in, in other uh, naval locations in the mainland, in Florida, where a lot of the, our, our members come over here and, and uh, serve the, the military, uh, there are drag strips, and it's very affordable for a Navy enlisted men to have an uh, a hobby that they can enjoy. So we got basically a letter of commendation from that. And it was because of that cooperation between the military and the, and the locals that we were very successful at having events. Now, I want to address one of the things that I think people don't understand. During those years, Many of you that did come to the drag strip saw a lot of professional cars come out. I, I see Willie Brennan and some of these other guys that, that actually brought professional cars out. And out of it, businesses were created. I saw the meddlers have an automotive shop. I saw Guam Automotive Clin Clinic flourish. I saw Shell uh, service stations uh, sponsor, you know, basically it was IP&E now sponsor a car, we had a uh, Guam sailor, we had all these corporate sponsors that, that had a professional car yet side by side on the same racetrack for a sportsman race, we were racing the average local Toyota or Nissan or whatever it is. So everybody had a fair chance to win not only money but prizes, uh, possibly gift certificates for fuel and stuff like that. So I think that if we can consider the value of this place, we can kind of think of it as uh, a benefit to our way of life on Guam. And, and you guys all know, I know that, that our quality of life is deteriorating. The price of gas is going up, we, crime's going up, we have problems with, uh, you know, our, our 
clash in our cultures where there's uh, problems in the schools and uh, thievery, everything else. In my day at drag, we tried to overcome those things and try to present ways for idle hands to do something, uh, you know, in cooperation with uh, the benefit of the public. So if, if you're thinking that 50 years is a long time, I agree. I've helped Henry and Joey and everybody else run smoking wheels, run all these other events. I've trashed and trashed my mind to find other uses for the racetrack. One of them is the Guam Soapbox Derby. I don't know if you, any, any of you came out to that. That was a great event. Unfortunately, uh, I don't know if it was shipping costs or what, we, we stopped having those. Um, we were even venues where we raised extra money because international stars from Japan and Australia and everywhere were coming and renting our track so that they could film a music video in a safe environment. You know, uh, th there were just so many uses. We raised money by bring, bringing a stunt motorcycle team to Guam to raise money for cancer and cancer prevention. Uh, Simon Sanchez came up and did races, they did car washes, they did swap meets, so they could raise money. One year, three of their members of their, their officers of their senior class came to me in tears. And they said, we'll be honest with you, Ed, if we don't raise $4,000, we're not gonna have graduation. So, good community members that we were, we held events for them and they were successful. The mayor, Jigo Robert Lazam at the time, came to me and wanted things to do in cooperation with their village fiesta. We did the same thing. Um, one of the, the projects of the municipal council in Jigo, which was very active at the time, uh, was to uh, erect village signs. I don't know if you guys ever seen the Jigo village signs. They're fantastic, they're concrete, they're typhoon proof, they're beautiful, and they've withstood the, you know, the test of time. So those are things that the racetrack has brought value to. I have to agree with Mr. Simpson that 50 years is what's needed if you're gonna get investors to come in and help us with our infrastructure because the, the length of time that we've waited to build this track, the costs have gone up, labor's gone up, H2 workers has been an issue, uh, tax uh, benefits because of the amount of work that the contractors have done has changed in value. So they've basically elected to do other things. So we're, 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 got this, we're facing this reality that the racetrack is actually too expensive to build as originally planned. We, we've got to be creative. And, and this team that I've had has starting with Mr. Simpson, has been very creative through the years. So I think we can do it. I do caution one thing because my, myself, I've looked at commercial leases and I've looked at public-private partnerships throughout, you know, since we've had our first elected governor and I've seen the good and the bad and the ugly. Um, I'm not saying there's no ugly in the Guam Racing Federation lease because I've seen problems amongst the years. I've seen racing factions fight amongst themselves, I've seen monopolies, I've seen everything. And I've tried to be as fair as I could at the drag strip, although I didn't control every racing event there at the time when I was there and I had the opportunity to do, but uh, if there was Miller beer on one side, there was Budweiser on the other side. If there was uh, uh, Mountain Dew on one side, we had Coca-Cola on the other side. And, and those are the opportunities that we tried to provide. We also, I would like to say, we're the start of the food trucks. At the drag strip, we invited anybody that wanted to bring a hot dog cart or a food truck and come and, 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 and sell there. You know, we never charged them or anything. You know, we said, if you want to make a donation, if you did well as a business, help us out. And they did. So those creations are the seeds that flourish. And I think that with caution, a 50-year lease would be a good thing. A 25-year lease, I've seen it fail because a lot of businesses and, and investors say, hey, the return on investment is too short. By the time we construct something in a couple years, 
you know, time's up. We saw that, you know, with this racetrack. Uh, 20 years was absolutely too quick, in my opinion. But, but I'd like for you senators to, to really look at being cautious. Being cautious. Uh, my secret of the drag strip in the past has been transparency. It's been honesty. If we got a problem, we talk about it. If the senators have a question, we make ourselves available. Um, I've invited all the senators through the years that I had been there to come out and watch a race. Uh, we've had Hall of Fame nominees at the drag strip where we've uh, recognized people in the community throughout the years that have contributed to the racing community. And those are programs that I think can be integrated between the community and the racetrack, which uh, causes awareness and everything else. Uh, you know, part of the uh, Buckle Up campaign, I remember in the past, we had something to do with that, and it's because our safety issues, and I've been accused of being too strict and too safe at the drag strip, but I'll tell you what, if you go back and look at my team's record from 98 to 2012, we have never had an injury besides a scrape. Uh, vehicles have burned, they flip, they've crashed, but we've never had a major casualty. And according to the National Hot Rod Association, in 2010, we were the safest racetrack in the United States. So in closing, I just want you guys to consider um, the quality of life on Guam and consider what you're voting on. And I, I commend Senator Atta for, for allowing uh, at least the idea, you know, inviting the idea of 50-year 50, 50 lease because all through my life, I, I felt that uh, Land is finite on Guam. It, it, it's something that, you know, we don't have an overabundance with. So we've got to be careful how we give it out. I've been very critical of the Tomorrow Land Trust Commission. Um, I don't know, a lot of people know me on Facebook. I've, I've hammered them for things they've done and, and things that they weren't transparent about. So I, I, I can speak on that part, and I, I thank you. I, just, I don't know what else to say. You know, the, the, the people came before me probably said everything. I did provide written testimony. You can go back and look at that and see the facts. It's all there. Thank you very much, Mr. Cruz. Thank you. Does anybody have any question of this panel? <laughs> okay. So with that, then, uh, we'll consider Bill 342-34-COR as having been duly heard. Uh, the committee will continue to receive written testimony until Friday, October 12th. And um, we will then adjourn this public hearing now. It is now uh, 10 minutes to 7.